In our previous videos, we discussed the definitions of a difficult airway, which included difficult mask ventilation, difficult supraglottic airway insertion, difficult laryngoscopy, and difficult intubation. In this video, we will move forward and focus on how we manage a difficult airway. The management of a difficult airway can be described in two main parts, which are pre-intubation assessment and intubation based on that assessment. During the pre-intubation phase, an anticipated difficult airway is recognized, which allows the anesthesiologist to prepare thoroughly by planning airway management strategies. Despite careful assessment, difficulty may still arise during the intubation phase, resulting in an unanticipated difficult airway. In such cases, rapid recognition and a structured response are essential. In pre-intubation planning, we assess five key areas as recommended by the American Society of Anesthesiologists. The five questions we ask are whether laryngoscopy is likely to be difficult, whether ventilation with a face mask or supraglottic device will be challenging, whether the patient carries a significant risk of aspiration, whether they are likely to desaturate rapidly during apnea, and whether performing an emergency invasive airway such as cricothyrotomy would be difficult. Based on these five key questions, we plan whether to proceed with induction and intubation or perform awake intubation. Let's look into each of the five questions, starting with laryngoscopy. If laryngoscopy is not predicted to be difficult, this usually suggests that intubation is likely to be straightforward and successful, so we may proceed with intubation after induction of general anesthesia. However, if laryngoscopy is expected to be difficult, then intubation may fail despite multiple attempts. In that case, it becomes essential to move on to the remaining questions, which help us determine whether ventilation and oxygenation can still be maintained safely if intubation is unsuccessful. Second, we assess the likelihood of difficult mask ventilation or supraglottic airway placement. These techniques act as safety measures for ventilation and oxygen delivery if intubation fails. If these backup measures are not feasible, the patient should remain awake and able to breathe on their own to avoid hypoxia. If mask ventilation and supraglottic airway use appear feasible, we may proceed with intubation even if laryngoscopy is predicted to be difficult. The reason is that we know oxygenation can still be maintained using these backup techniques if intubation fails. However, before committing to this approach, we still need to consider the remaining questions to ensure overall safety. Third, we assess the risk of aspiration. Patients who are non-fasted, pregnant, or have gastrointestinal obstruction are at higher risk for aspirating gastric contents. After induction, this risk increases because general anesthesia abolishes protective reflexes such as coughing and gagging, which normally guard the airway. If aspiration risk is high, especially when combined with predicted difficult laryngoscopy or ventilation, we should strongly consider awake intubation to preserve airway reflexes. If the risk is minimal and ventilation is expected to be easy, intubation after induction may be appropriate. Fourth, we assess the potential for rapid oxygen desaturation because during the apneic period of intubation, oxygen is no longer delivered to the body. So, patients with limited reserve will desaturate faster, increasing the risk of hypoxia and related complications. In such cases, awake intubation should be considered to reduce the risk during apnea. Finally, we anticipate potential difficulty in accessing invasive airways such as cricothyrotomy and prepare the necessary equipment and strategies to ensure rapid access if standard airway management fails. Only after this assessment should we proceed with intubation following induction of general anesthesia. If invasive airway access is deemed difficult, we must again consider awake intubation. Any single factor, or a combination of factors, may be significant enough to make awake intubation the safer option. Now, there are two possible outcomes with awake intubation, which is usually performed using fiber optic guidance. 
Awake intubation can either be successful or it may fail. In the event of failure, we must resort to alternative invasive techniques, such as awake tracheostomy under local anesthesia, which would require the involvement of an ENT surgeon. When the airway is deemed not difficult, we can proceed with intubation after induction of anesthesia. Most guidelines advocate a stepwise approach to airway management, which incorporates all available techniques. These include tracheal intubation, face mask ventilation, supraglottic airway placement, and, in a cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate situation, front of neck access. The 2022 ASA guideline for post-induction difficult airway management begins with an initial attempt at intubation. If this attempt fails, two key principles should guide the next steps. First, call for backup support early. Second, limit the number of intubation attempts, as repeated efforts increase the risk of trauma, edema, and laryngospasm or bronchospasm. To optimize the success of the second attempt at intubation, it is necessary to first ventilate the patient to replenish the oxygen reserve. Ventilation is most often performed with a face mask, with or without the aid of an oral airway. If face mask ventilation fails, a supraglottic airway device should be used to attempt ventilation. From there, depending on whether ventilation and oxygenation are adequate, two different pathways emerge. If oxygenation can be maintained with a face mask or supraglottic airway, we follow the non-emergent pathway, which allows time to reassess, optimize technique, and consider alternative intubation strategies. If, however, ventilation and oxygenation cannot be maintained, the situation becomes emergent, and we must immediately proceed with rescue measures. The non-emergency pathway is followed when initial intubation has failed, but the patient can still be ventilated with a face mask or supraglottic airway. In this situation, one option is to awaken the patient and postpone the case, since ventilation is stable. If that is not possible, reattempting intubation may be considered, but only after optimizing ventilation and oxygenation. This can include calling for a more experienced provider, using advanced techniques such as video laryngoscopy, trying a different blade, employing adjuncts like a bougie or stylet, or considering intubation through a laryngeal mask airway. It is also important to evaluate whether the procedure can safely continue using face mask or supraglottic airway ventilation alone. Intubation attempts must be limited, as repeated attempts increase the risk of airway trauma, swelling, and laryngospasm. The key principle is that further attempts should only continue as long as ventilation remains effective. If at any point ventilation becomes inadequate, the pathway immediately shifts to the emergency route. The emergency pathway is taken when intubation has failed and ventilation with both face mask and supraglottic airway is also unsuccessful, a situation known as cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate. In this critical scenario, help must be called immediately because the patient is no longer being ventilated and oxygen reserves will rapidly deplete. Preparation for invasive airway access should begin without delay, using options such as surgical cricotherotomy, needle cricotherotomy, or surgical tracheostomy. While preparations are underway, one may attempt further intubation only if optimization strategies are applied, but it is vital to remain aware of the limited time available. Attempts should be kept to a minimum, and if oxygenation is not restored, the clinician must proceed promptly to emergency invasive airway access to prevent hypoxia and cardiac arrest. To summarize, airway management begins with pre-intubation assessment guided by five critical questions. These help us decide whether to proceed with awake intubation or intubation after induction of general anesthesia. Awake intubation is usually performed with a fiber optic scope, but if it fails, an awake tracheostomy under local anesthesia may be required. If assessment suggests intubation will not be difficult, we proceed after induction. Should the initial attempt fail, 
our priority is to maintain oxygenation. We start with face mask ventilation. If this is successful, we follow the non-emergency pathway, either awakening the patient or trying alternative intubation techniques to improve success. If face mask ventilation is inadequate, we insert a supraglottic airway. When this provides effective ventilation, we again remain on the non-emergency pathway and may even continue surgery under a supraglottic device if appropriate. However, if both mask and supraglottic ventilation fail, and intubation is also unsuccessful, we face a can't intubate, can't ventilate situation. At this point, we must switch immediately to the emergency pathway and secure the airway through invasive techniques such as cricothyrotomy or tracheostomy. This is the 2015 Unanticipated Difficult Airway Management Algorithm from the Difficult Airway Society. It follows the same principle as the ASA guideline, providing a clear emergency pathway when intubation is unexpectedly difficult. The algorithm begins with Plan A, where the goal is tracheal intubation. Up to three attempts are allowed, with a possible fourth by a more experienced colleague, but each attempt must be optimized. If intubation fails, the process moves to Plan B. Plan B involves insertion of a supraglottic airway device, ideally a second-generation device. If oxygenation is restored, the team should pause to decide whether to wake the patient, continue with surgery using the device, or attempt intubation through it. If oxygenation is not possible, the algorithm advances to Plan C. Plan C is a return to face mask ventilation. If this restores oxygenation, the safest option is to awaken the patient. If oxygenation still cannot be achieved, the situation becomes can't intubate, can't oxygenate, which requires Plan D. Plan D is immediate emergency front of neck access, usually by scalpel cricothyroidotomy, to re-establish oxygenation and save the patient's life. That's all for this video. In our next video, we will discuss about awake fiber optic intubation.